So, Guy, first of all, did you try conventional therapies before this? I mean, what, what sort of process did you go through initially? Yeah, I just saw someone in the chat talking about EMDR. I had a session of EMDR. Um, that was not fun. It was not good. Um, but I know it has worked for other people. Um, I've had various... Do you know what? I haven't had that great success with talking therapies. I just, to endure the relationship between me and another therapist was very difficult. Um, partly the way that I left the military, I, I was very tearful for a good amount of time and I went to one of the medical officers and I told her, I was like, hey, like, something's wrong. And uh, she just said, well, guy, you're a Lance Corporal now. Um, you're just demotivated in your work role and you'll figure it out. Uh, and off, off I went. Um, and after that, that feeling, that invalidation, I applied to other mental health people. And I was like, I just don't, I, I just don't trust them to handle me in the same way. Um, so in that sense, I was treatment resistant. And, and that's what you'll find with a lot of veterans. Like, it's really hard to sit there and endure talking therapy with someone that you don't know, even to establish that relationship if they, if they haven't been there. Um, it's just, it's difficult to get people to stay and engage, which is why I guess psychedelics are seen as such a breakthrough therapy because, you know, you know that you're, you're, it's your own personal journey and, and all these insights are gonna come from within inside yourself. Yes, you always have a therapist beforehand, during and integration way after, um, which is so important, but it all comes from you. It's all about, your own perspective, understanding yourself. And then after you've understood yourself without this, uh, this little ego that you looked through your whole life, once you understand that, you know, there's, there's something deeper, um, you can start to see how your previous way of thinking was affecting your relationships. And then once you start changing your relationships, you change your world. And once you step into that, like feeling of light and love just and just greet everyone with it unconditional love for everyone that you meet it's like ah oh, my world is transformed and it's just I'm not saying it's going to be like that for everyone but that's just my personal experience and, and it's just it's been amazing no that's awesome um grace when we talk about things like uh, the default mode network and serotonergic systems and um all these kind of technical terms, it can be a little bit overwhelming. Could you break down really simply what is going on in the brain during these psychedelic experiences? Yeah, um, I, I, well, I'll do my very best. Um, so, you know, the, the serotonergic system is, uh, serotonin is one of the key neurotransmitters in the brain and it's one to do a lot with mood and emotion um, and things like that. And so when you, um, take a classic psychedelic like psilocybin, like ayahuasca or LSD. Uh, it works on um, a number of, there's not just one singular receptor, but the main receptor it works on, um, which is as, as we've seen in the film, the 5-HT2A receptor, um, it has action there. So the same action that you, you might see from serotonin, so it, increasing mood, um, but then it also increases, um, glutamate activation and um, production of transcription uh, molecules and neurotropic molecules, which probably doesn't mean anything, just saying that um, if you're not really into your neuroscience, but basically what that does is you get a sort of downstream action that means that uh, the way that the, the neurons in, in the brain works is it's a very plastic effect. That's how sort of memory and any connections in the brain happen. Um, and so it increases the plasticity, the ability of the brain to uh, move and form around and form new connections and, and therefore new memories um, and, and new ways of thinking, as it were. And then also produces these neurotrophic factors, which basically help the brain to grow. Uh, they help, you know, something called BDNF, they help the sort of growth of neurons. And so that further helps with, um, improving your ability to to um, 
think differently and, and have, have new methods of thought. And then when we look at something, you know, the, the default mode network, what's that? Um, the default mode network is basically the part of the brain that is sort of active when you're not focusing on a particular task. You've not got a particular executive function that you're trying to achieve. You know, it's sort of the mind is wandering and it's very much where we feel that, you know, the ego is, the self, you know, like um, I think was said briefly in the film, this idea of this narrative that we all hold about ourselves and who we are and, you know, what our sort of morals are and what, what we believe and all that, you know, we actually form that narrative in our brains and then we live out our lives and the way that we respond to people and the way that our emotions are in certain situations based off these sort of coded parts of the default no, uh, mode network that, that we hold about ourselves. So I've told you a little bit about the chemical side of what happens when we take psychedelics, but from more of a sort of um, neurocircuitry side, um, you know, just sort of briefly touching on something very important to PS PTSD is the idea that we, we do see some reduction in um, the sort of amygdala response to some emotional processing. And, and the amygdala is the part of the brain that is very much the sort of prime primeval uh, fear response area. But then we also see the default mode network where it has been sort of um, very rigid in its activity getting disrupted. And what we see is parts of the brain that are not normally talking to each other under the influence of psychedelics then do start to have um, functional connectivity between them. And so overall, what is happening is you've got a sort of brain that's got very, you know, that particularly when you have a psychological disorder like PTSD, like depression, where you get a brain that's very inflexible in its, um, in its sort of activation and you get sort of very inflexible habits of thought. Um, and you basically see psychedelics breaking some of those connections, allowing activation to happen between this circuit and that circuit that wouldn't normally happen. And then as the acute effects of the, the psychedelic wear off, you've almost kind of changed the rigidness of that circuitry and you can start to kind of rewire and rewire with more healthy thoughts. Um, and then if you don't mind me sort of rabbiting on, I'll, I'll go on to why that's important from a psychological perspective because then you get this sort of transient experience of it all. And from that transient experience, you get to kind of rethink what you want those narratives to be, rethink who you are um, in the context of, you know, perhaps a trauma or, um, you know, a situation that you're, you're in and you, your brain is then supported by the fact that you've got the opportunity to sort of rewire these new circuits. And then you've got that supported by this increase in um, factors that increase neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. Um, so yeah, I hope that kind of made sense to everybody. Yeah, that's a great explanation, I think. It covered a lot of, of key points. Um, and I'm putting you on the spot here a little bit, but how widespread is the problem of PTSD in the UK? Do you have any, any numbers on that? And how effective are current treatments? We don't really have many numbers. And, and I think it's, you know, like with a lot of, um, like a lot of psychological disorders, it's all very sliding scale. Um, you know, who's going to say where the cutoff line is for have you experienced a trauma or not? Um, I can speak a bit to the veteran community. Um, you know, it was highlighted in the film there, just um, the plight of suicide among, among the veteran community. Um, and that is really bad. Um, I don't think we have any idea numbers wise quite how many people come out of the army with a level of um, PTSD, but I, I would imagine it's a lot. Um, but just as far as, you know, the general population and sort of psychological disorders, unfortunately, an awful lot of, um, you know, affective disorders like depression and uh, and PTSD do do stem from from trauma um, and suppressed trauma that people haven't really thought about, and then that it sort of comes out in other ways, and they think it's um, about this, that, and the other. So, I feel that we don't need to just say, you know, this is a drug for PTSD. I feel like this is a drug for a lot of people who are struggling in a lot of different areas in their life, and it, it shouldn't be 
sort of packaged up as, you know, this is just a drug for this. It's a drug for, um, I'm not going to say everybody, but it, it's a drug for quite a lot of people to achieve um, a better, healthier um, overall life. And Guy, I think I'm right in saying that you had uh, complex PTSD or CPTSD. Guy, uh, sorry, Grace, could you just explain what the complex part of that means and why it's significant? Yeah, so um, I think when a lot of people think about PTSD um, and when we see PTSD in a civilian aspect, it, it can be a lot more um, down to somebody got mugged or, um, you know, there, there was one singular event that happened that then gets, um, you know, very sort of deeply coded in the memory um, and they sort of relive that moment. Um, and I know that guy mentioned there was one particular incident that became quite significant for him. But when we look at what happens with veterans, often it is not just about uh, them having this one singular moment when something happened to them and when I've spoken to a lot of uh, veterans what they say is it's more about often what they did and, and sometimes that's not even just on a personal day that can be as a section a platoon or as you know the entire army going into a situation and sort of coming to terms with that that narrative we all hold in our brains about who we are and then that narrative held with what they did in that situation and so there is a level of sort of guilt around all of that and then further to that once you come out of the the situation you know you come out of the theater of war you're back home you're sitting there with your children and your family and all the rest of it and you start to contextualize what happened to you out um at, at war as it were that can be incredibly difficult and incredibly disturbing for people and so the trauma is not just sort of I need to get over you know the fact somebody's going to walk up behind me in the street it, it's it's about so much more than that it's a much more complex string and to compact that in further within the veteran community quite often you know with infantry special forces um, units a, they have training that quite deliberately puts you under high pressure and high stress so that you can um, operate effectively when you are under that, um, you know, in, in, the, in the moments of which you're training for. But also, you know, whilst you're out there, you're, you're hyper vigilant the entire time. And, you know, the brain is just not meant, made to be in this super intense, something could happen any moment state for so long. Um, and that can cause sort of um, some of the sort of information and reduced plasticity just, you know, from a chemical level that um, psilocybin can then can then help with. So, yeah, so it's a combination of the environment that you are in in war, um, you know, the, the sort of guilt and feelings about yourself within the context of war, alongside those really traumatic events that happen that compose what, you know, we would describe as a sort of complex PTSD situation yeah and i'll just uh just talk quickly about the complex ptsd it was it was first a tutor at my university who sort of noticed it um and then i became sort of more of aware and i think chris here said it's a it's a short change answer answer from professionals um yeah but it is just that it's 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 bloody complex and like mine came from stuff that happened when I was one to three years old and that there was a death in the family and intergenerational trauma. So you've got very sensitive kids joining the military because you're searching for a sense of belonging. And that this isn't just a isolated incident with, with myself. This is my best friend. He was in and out of foster homes. My other friend saw his mum get stabbed. My other friend ran away when he was 12. My like, these are my like, close circle of friends who joined the military so we've got to look at why people are joining the military who are very sensitive in the first place um and i think that will show why some people may be more prone to getting ptsd and that's why it's complex because you've got this underlying sensitivity with big trauma plonked on on top so then you've got to do the work well i'm doing it backwards big trauma first move that out of the way okay, relational trauma, 
developmental trauma when I was younger through no fault of my family's just because there was such low levels of um you know of feeling around the death of of my mum's brother and it's all it's all understandable um so yeah I just wanted to emphasize that like let's look at the backgrounds from where people in the military are joining the frontline troops and obviously also the officers but mostly the people who you know are stepping out there and in front of everyone else because I think that's going to be a real key to to sort of getting to the root cause of this. Yeah I think that's a really interesting point and it's it sounds obvious when you say it but there seems to be a selection bias into the military for people with what Ben Sessa might call small t or big t, big t trauma. Um, this is maybe a good time to bring in Keith. Um, Keith What's, what was your own background in the military and how did you come to, to be CEO of Heroic Hearts? I was a, I was a paratrooper in my military career. Uh, I fought in Iraq and Afghanistan. And very similar to Guy's experience. Um, he also makes a very good point about the people that join the military. Um, I would side with that as, a, as my own opinion as well. But um, yes, fighting in Afghanistan was pretty intense. And I started to struggle personally when I came home, found that conventional therapies didn't really work, a, a very typical experience, not just for the military, but for a lot of civilians as well. And I'd kind of lost hope. And so right at the end of my tether, I was introduced to the idea of ayahuasca took myself off to Peru, had an ayahuasca experience, a couple of ayahuasca ceremonies. And I left the jungle and I was psychologically, I had been healed. Um, so I kind of immediately understood the significance and the power of that experience, what I'd had, and therefore I wanted to share it with others. But it took me a little while to integrate it. Uh, we can speak about integration later. But really, I said it in the in the film just at the end there that there was I can't remember if it, I think it was 2018, but it could have been 2019. There was a, there was an eight week period where two people in my community were killing themselves every day. That, that's a lot of people, and it was driving me. It was diff, that was very difficult for me. I might not have known them personally, but they were still in my network. You know, like I hadn't met them. Two people killing themselves every day is it's a, that that mounts up is a big deal. And so I'm sat there thinking, I think I might have the answer for this ayahuasca or psychedelic therapy at least. And so that was the time where I was like, you know what, I need to start an organization where I can get veterans access to psychedelic therapy. And so privately, I started to organize a retreat in Peru but then I realized that it would be better to do it as a charitable organization. And then I was introduced to a guy called Jesse Gould, who's a veteran in America. And he's the founder of Heroic Hearts Project, the wider project. And we agreed that I would start up Heroic Hearts UK. And um, that's me as CEO. And it's great to have Guy and Grace and, and, and yourself and the, the other members of the team are just, has just been incredible, really. It's been an incredible year. We've, we've only been running just over a year and it's been, you know, it's been incredible what we've been able to achieve already. So what are Heroic Hearts doing at the moment and what's, what's on the horizon? What we're doing at the moment is, oh, there's a lot, there's a lot. Um, so tell me to stop if I keep going. Um, most importantly, our prime directive, quoting Robocop, is to uh, get veterans the healing they need as soon as we can we're not interested really in waiting um, to get people through 12 weeks of psychotherapy and then see how they are on on pharmaceuticals if after the vetting is complete if we believe that they're appropriate for a, a psychedelic therapy then we'll send them on retreat and we do that through ayahuasca therapy in peru or in other central and latin american countries or psilocybin therapy in the Netherlands. We've got a ayahuasca retreat on the 15th of November, and we've got a psilocybin retreat, perhaps late September, October, that's not confirmed yet. 
Uh, we are starting an ambassadors program, which Guy can speak about shortly. Um, we are also in the initial stages of starting a compassionate access campaign, which is which has been inspired by Theracil in Canada. Um, if I may briefly, what happened in Canada is that there were four cancer patients that were terminal, they were dying. And Theracil um, approached the Canadian government and requested that they treat these four people with psilocybin to try and ease their end of life anxiety. They treated those four very successfully. And now they're up to 25 um, participants. So it's been an incredibly successful campaign. It's still ongoing now. So we're inspired by that, hoping to treat treatment-resistant depression with general anxiety disorder among a small cohort of veterans, but doing it here in the UK, um, which is very exciting if we manage to do it. What else are we doing? We've got, there's another documentary that will soon be released as well, talking about ayahuasca in particular. And I think that might be about it for the time being. Um, I, I think it would be very um, valuable for Guy to speak about the Ambassadors Programme because of the, the audience that we have here today as well. So I'll, um, I'll shut up now. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, Guy, do you want to explain that, um, that Ambassador Programme to us? Uh, Mags has just put in the chat as well. Please, um, please sign up to our mailing list. It really helps. Um, there's a link to the website there. And uh, follow us on Instagram as well, if you can. I'll put the link in, but yeah. Um, yeah, so the ambassador program or the vision for the ambassador program is to create a network um, of volunteers in the UK who will help assist veterans um, for when they come back from retreats. Um, by assist them, I mean, anything from just you know listening to them helping them integrate their experience um just through reflective listening or you know there's there's people who are coming forward who already are practicing um like mental health practitioners already so those people um may be able to lend you know a bit more of an ear in in other aspects but basically anyone and everyone who wants to um, help assist veterans for when they come back from from these retreats um, and that you know it really doesn't have to be someone who's done 20 years in the mental health sort of industry it can just be you know our wonderful elders people who have got lots of life experience and um, you know give those pearls of wis wisdom um, and yeah that's I mean, there's a lot more to it and it's, it's great because we're gonna be able to, you know, um, sort of expand this and help it to grow just through people volunteering and, and bringing forth their skills. Um, so we're in the process now of coming up with um, some SOPs in the military, what we call standing, standing operating procedures um, so that when people come forward, we can, well, we're designing an app so you'll be able to after being vetted. So you might have a nice interview with me um, either via Zoom or if you're in London face to face, fingers crossed one day, hopefully, um, you know, just to, just to make sure that we understand that when people are coming to you, there's no ideology being pushed. There's no politics. Um, this is just all about listening to that person and, and just encouraging them to tell their true and honest story in a, in a safe, and contain place um, and the bigger that we can grow this network you know the better because it means that if you come back from a retreat and you need a face-to-face -face with someone that you know you'll be able to go on the app and see oh look um, Joe Mallet is in Essex or whatever and she's free for a cup of tea on a Saturday between 11 and 4 yeah I'll go around and and you know and say hello and and, and talk out my experience so just a really wholesome, lovely network of, of willing volunteers. Um, but yeah, it'll be a couple of months while that's up and running before I can start getting onboarding people onto the app and stuff. But uh, um, yeah, don't hesitate to, to give me an email or to give us an email at Heroic Hearts um, on the website. And yeah, just look forward to 
leaking more information to you soon and getting people signed up and and having some more interviews and saying hello I think it's uh, I think it's important to reiterate that point that guy made there is that you don't have to have and I've just seen it come up on a chat you don't have to have uh, experience with psychedelic therapy the, yourself as a volunteer and you don't have to be qualified in, as a psychotherapist or something like that you could just be another veteran who's happy to have a cup of tea and listen to someone talk um, another important point is that we do heroic hearts i'm speaking about now we do actually offer preparatory training and integration training to the participants on the retreats what we're talking about with ambassadors program here is actually in addition to that after that is that there's someone those group that group integration coaching will be done online and the benefit of having an ambassadors program an ambassadors network across the uk is that there's someone physically in your town or nearby and that can be that can be very valuable so it's really exciting to get this network across the uk of people that are interesting in serving in some small way and and helping some of our service users and just to answer Kat in the chat, how do you foresee managing safeguarding for both veteran and volunteers? Great question. But um, so the, the veterans would have been, they would have gone through a massive amount of vetting. They will have support from the retreat, from um, you know the management and more senior level, and then also the ambassadors program. And then those people who are volunteering their time, um, they'll be able to sort of document that time or say that you know when when they're having visits and you know it's uh yeah it'll be a very you know people will be communicating the whole time back and forth yeah we've got a we've got a pretty strict um vetting process both for participants or like applicants not even participants for applicants both as service users but also as guy just said there's the um for anyone that's offering their services, they'll have to go through a vetting process as well. Um, but it's still an exciting time to have people volunteering because pe I think everyone's coming to understand, not everyone, that's, that's an exaggeration. There's a growing number of people in the wider society that are beginning to get a whisper that psychedelic therapy is genuine and is perhaps more powerful than anything that we've got currently in our toolbox for mental health treatment. Um, which everyone on everyone in our team believes that that's absolutely true and there's some good evidence to support that for sure yeah that sounds really wonderful i really hope we can get this sort of network um up and running um i'm going to ask one last question and then we'll go to audience q a so if you guys have a question if you raise your hand so you press reactions and then raise hand um, and then I'll, I'll come to you in turn but um keith and guy What's, what's your feeling on sort of how this is received at the moment within the, the veteran community and, and the military more generally? Um, can I go first, Guy? Yeah, yeah go on, boss man. <laughs> um, the military. So, interestingly, privately, when I first started this, a general that I, I know, that sounds very grand, he's just a former commanding officer of mine who's now a general, He's, he was very, very supportive of the idea of, of this whole idea, but publicly, yeah, he couldn't go anywhere near me, anywhere near us as an, an organization. But I'm beginning to hear that there are conversations being had in the higher ranks uh, within the military, that this might be an option. You know, they're not getting excited by any stretch of the imagination, but there are conversations I understand that are being had um, so that's in the, the, the higher ranks of the military. I think in the veterans network at kind of our level where we're operating, there's still a lot of pushback. I've had some difficult messages on social media when I was first starting Heroic Arts. I should have known better than to get involved. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of veterans are, are um, skeptical to say the least. So we've got a lot of work. We've got a lot of work to do, but all we can do is reach out as far as we can and whoever feels that we can be of service, if they pass the vetting process, then, then they're in. Uh, so, you know, what more can we do? 
yeah um and just you know like the immediate friendship circle that I have from the from the military like all my mates are super supportive um and everyone's really you know well I've got a lot of friends who come forward and they're keen to give it a go themselves it's of course it's not that simple um but yeah like like why if they you know if they watch the documentary of they've just seen the way that I've changed my self-esteem has risen and and the way that I'm engaging with the world compared to where I was like there's there's just no judgment there and I think it's it's so that's how it will slowly spread but um hopefully it'll be me on the other side of a camera with with many more veterans telling their individual stories that's where I want to be um because I you know veteran stories are, are so powerful um but it's you know and it's not just but that's not someone here was in the comments was saying I understand the importance of treating PTSD um just in the military but what about civilian access this is like we're talking civilian access as well this this is not an exclusion at all but there is a lot that lies in a in a story of of a veteran as well there's there's a sort of I don't know to to drive the move, movement forward there's sort of all these connected people already um with powerful stories and I think that in terms of the psychedelic movement as you know, slow and steady as we take it, I think it can just be a very powerful way to speak into politicians who sent us to Afghanistan. It's you know, like, like where's it, you know, there's there's got to be morals and ethics questions there. Um, so yeah, it's the um, the the thing of, the why we're doing this for veterans is yes, we're military veterans ourselves, but Heroic Hearts is open to emergency services veterans as well because police firefighters, ambulance drivers, we all experience very similar traumatic um, situations. Also, we also, I've also found that elite sporting athletes also struggle in very similar ways, which might sound surprising to some, but actually when a veteran leaves the military, that lack of purpose and that lack of self-worth is a massive part of the problem. And when an elite athlete finishes their career, they actually feel very similar. They, they've got no self-worth anymore. Their whole self-worth was attached to their profession. And when they're not that professional anymore, they dive bomb. So we're finding that elite sports athletes are actually a very natural addition to our group. We can't open it up too much further to the whole of um, society because we're only a small organization at the moment. And perhaps more importantly at this point, is because veterans, I believe, are, are a great barometer for mental health treatments. If it were, And we're generally a well-regarded, well-respected community cross-section of society. So if we, with our traumas, we go and test these therapies and we get healed, then that's a great barometer for wider society. So hence, yeah, we can't open it up to everyone because of time and energy constraints but we do believe that society will be changed profoundly by psychedelic therapy profoundly all aspects there are sorry if you don't mind me just answering this briefly there are actually um liam modlin liam is i believe an israeli vet he works out of Kings and he runs, I think it's a weekly or it, it might be a monthly, I'm not quite sure, but he runs a regular uh, psychedelic integration group, public, public group. And he's not the only one, you know. And then to further answer your question is that this is where our ambassadors program really would kick in because then you would be able to approach certain people on the ambassadors network that are qualified to offer that sort of therapy, that sort of service. Um, so really good question. Um, hopefully that's of some help. If you need more information about that, you can just contact us through the website and I'll, I'll connect you or I'll give you as much information as I can find. Phil put something in the chat, which he said, is it, does, is the treatment ongoing after you've had the experience? And I just wanted to, I guess, amend that or change that to ask, 
Keith and Guy and maybe Will as well, whether you feel cured now or whether you whether it's still an ongoing process or whether that's even the right question to ask. Um, so I'll just quickly say my experience. The big trauma is out of the way, but I still have a psychotherapist so, and I go and, and speak to him and he'll try and bring everything back around to Afghanistan. I'm like, I'm an open book around that trauma now. Like, like I, I can say anything without going into any depth of like emotion. My, I don't have nightmares anymore. Like I don't wake up in cold sweats, um, which means that I use alcohol less. I use recreational drugs less or more responsibly. Um, so once the big trauma has moved, but once it did move, I realized I had ADD or I was neurodivergent, um, which has been massively brought up in in COVID. Um, so the so the integration from from Barcelona is still going a year and a half later. Like I'm still unpacking. It's more for the fact that in these psychedelic experiences, when you have these breakthroughs, it's like everything suddenly aligns, and you and you start talking through truth and authenticity from yourself and and you just remove the bullshit you just that like you just you know you don't you don't have these survival mechanisms or you you might still have some of them as your ego builds back up but you're just a lot more honest with yourself um and then once you're being completely honest with yourself and you're not scared to look into the places where you used to fear then as you start bringing up this repress shadow side of yourself and question it like oh like why am I smoking like I hate the taste of smoking like why am I doing it oh it's because every 20 minutes or so you get this feeling of frustration or boredom when you're doing work okay then why is it a cigarette well okay don't don't have a cigarette go for a walk and eat a piece of fruit like you want to look after your body now and it's just like just slowly but surely because I'm now connecting with mind and body I know what I want to do and it's it's not the stuff that will endanger my life any further it's not risky behavior it's not you know high amounts of binging alcohol on the weekend it's it's like right how can I now live long and healthy life like that's cool to me now um so it's been a massive process of maturation if anything an initiation into becoming a like an adult and that affects my relationships like with my partner and and everything else so it's just it's just so transformative if if you get there um and of course you know like i am like my story seen as a bit of a success story but i do believe that with adequate pre-therapy the right retreat and the right post therapy like everyone can can move forward and that like i'm healed of my big trauma but i'm not gonna lie like i know i've got a lifetime of work to to heal from stuff that's happened neurologically or at least lived with it like the way that my mind works in a in a better way and actually I love my brain now it's it's innovative it's creative it's imaginative like my my ADD is like part of my power it's just not so great when you're stuck at home trying to do a dissertation yeah I think that's a good way of putting it really this the the, the big t trauma and then there's the small t trauma you know and just because we're veterans we don't own either of those labels plenty of other people have them um and so the work does still go on yeah because life brings new challenges um but you might not necessarily i suppose what's important here is that let's say let's use guy's experience here is that you have big t trauma like i did and you heal from that what is possible and what's beautiful about psychedelics is that again actually just from my experience i won't generalize just my experience is that you get given the tools for working with life from then on so i was healed from my big t trauma and then moving forward i had the tools that i needed so ayahuasca she taught me these tools and behaviors whereby i would be far less likely to um, experience more trauma that doesn't mean to say that it keeps you safe from life's random events or seemingly random events it's just that you're better equipped to deal with it 
Uh, that's that's and and guy actually alluded to that himself already actually so i'm just repeating just repeating everything he said um do you, do you mind if i just carry on here lucy has just written something here um about sexual trauma um heroic hearts in the us are so while heroic hearts uk we're open to emergency services and um, military veterans i know it might not be much help to you lucy but heroic hearts us are open to uh, vets with sexual trauma. Um, and so much like Grace was saying earlier, it's not about, oh, ayahuasca, psilocybin, MDMA or whatever is, is a cure for, or a potential cure for PTSD or complex PTSD or anything, any specific diagnosis, it treats it can treat a vast array of issues and disorders and the underlying issues. So while it may feel like the trauma is too intense and too much to be ever expected to be healed, my experience and the experience of many, many other people around the world is that they have healed from particularly significant trauma. And there's no reason why you can't also heal from that trauma. So Kat has asked a question, which is maybe a good one for Grace to address. Um, asking, is my connection all right? Asking, what is the risk of a bad trip and therefore a counterproductive experience? Yeah, um, I think the risk of a bad trip is something that we all need to be aware of as, you know, uh, something that, that can happen. Um, as I slightly alluded to earlier, these drugs are not for everyone. There, there are some people who just really don't tolerate them very well. Um, and so my advice really on a bad trip has is, is definitely got to come down to the idea of set and setting, which I'm, I'm sure a lot of you will have heard before. So that's sort of the setting that you are in, you know, the environment immediately around you at the time that you're doing the drug and, you know, the people that are going to be there to support you through the experience and the set is your, your mindset at that time. If you go into uh, a psychedelic experience in quite an acutely distressed state, um, you know, this is not like taking a sedative. It's not gonna bring you down from that distressed state. It will probably actually alleviate that and make the likelihood of you having a, a, a bad trip worse. So they certainly shouldn't be used in that kind of setting um, and then also you need to just have done the, the preparatory work for when you're in the state so when you're there it's not super easy to to then work out okay what do I need to kind of do and think about and all the rest of it um, so being super mindful about um, why you're taking it um, and also you know, who you're taking it with and, and the, the environment that you're in is a huge mediator of, the, of that risk of having a bad trip and making sure you've sort of done your homework on dosage and, and all the rest of it. Uh, yeah, and I suppose that, that, that would be my sort of maximum advice. You know, there's no sort of hard and fast definite on, on why some people have bad trips and, and why they don't, but Proper preparation should mitigate the majority of the risk on that. Yeah, agreed. And I would add, I'll just put it in the text there. I, this does, these are not mutually exclusive points, everything that Grace said, I believe. But just because you're having a bad trip doesn't mean that you're not getting healed. Um, I am a big, people always say, oh, I had a really bad trip. But again, if you take what advice Grace has just given there, which is absolutely correct, you still might have a bad trip. It might be incredibly difficult, but that doesn't mean that you're not being healed of your trauma. Anyone who expects their healing process to be easy and pleasant is going to be shocked and surprised. Um, it's a difficult, healing is, a, is the hardest thing that we can do. And so to expect it to be nice and unicorns and rainbows is nonsense. It's going to be hard hard work but again with everything that grace just said preparation the right setting with the right support network and then the correct integration afterwards you will most you will highly likely 
get the healing that you need, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy or pleasant. Yeah, sorry, just to jump in, I completely agree with Keith there on the, the idea that sort of all trips are, are beneficial and sort of this comes back to the idea of, you know, is this going to be suddenly you, you just take this drug and then you're cured like it. It's certainly um, a huge catalyst to psychotherapy and helping people to heal, but it is not some kind of wonder drug that you just take it and then and then you're healed. There is a lot of work to be done and that work comes from you. Um, and a lot of that work is not going to be easy. You know, what, uh, what we're talking about here is, you know, traumatic things that have happened to people. Um, and although there is a, you know, a huge blunting from the drug in the uh, initial sort of emotional response, response of thinking about the trauma which is what makes these these drugs so useful for accessing trauma it's still not um you're still going to have to access it you you still have to go back through um you know all of the uh you know baggage i, I don't really want to say the word baggage but you still got to go back through all of that stuff and do the work to integrate that into your into your psyche um and all the rest of it um and so yeah what is a what is a bad trip? Well, what, what is a good trip? You know, we're we're not advocating that these drugs are some kind of you know you're going to have a party. That's that's really not their intention. Uh, Chris, I think wants to weigh in on this. So, Chris, if you want to unmute and ask your question or comment. Chris, that was really lovely and heartfelt. Yeah. Thank you for being so vulnerable as well and so honest and sharing your story. Um, and I, like, I'd just like to make an observation. I've been, my dissertation, I've been interviewing um, mental health professionals who use psychedelics in their private life with the idea to talk about love, affect or emotion and touch and sort of understand why psychotherapists are using them themselves to inform their practice and also with the aim in the future. And yeah, like we, we talked about recreational use, like what's recreational use? Having fun with your friends. Okay, some people can't understand how to, or they might not do that in a safe setting, but that's just through lack of education. We haven't talked about drugs enough and explained to people if you take MDMA, you lose part of that fear inside of you. So, you know, remember to have someone sober with you. So if you go climbing up a bit of stage scaffolding, like, you know, you've got someone sober there, like it's just like alcohol. And it's just because we don't have this education, like recreational drug use at festivals is across the country. Hundreds of thousands of people do it because there is benefit to our health. I'm not like, I'm not saying that that's what we advocate, but I'm saying like, you know, we shouldn't feel shame if we've used that in the past but this is about education and research and moving forward with the right intention and keeping that you know sacred and and with morals and ethics like behind it i just yeah just don't feel any any shame for any sort of thing that you've done in the past to help with your with your pain because i just think you invalidate your own journey I think that's a brilliant way to end it and it's been really uh, eye-opening for all of us, especially especially myself. Um, Dan Lawton, the director, was meant to be on this panel as well, but he had to, he got called away for a shoot, unfortunately. But I think to end this, I did a, a short interview with him. Um, it's eight minutes long, so I will share my screen and play that. Um, and then after that, the meeting will end. Um, but Guys, thank you all so much. It's been really, really um, fascinating and, and honest. And I think everyone's everyone's really enjoyed it. And I just, it's a great documentary, I think. Um, Dan, someone put in the chat, but uh, asking if he could share share the link with friends and family. Dan's happy for, for that to happen. He, he wants to get people to watch it um, as long as it's not posted just publicly or online. 
um, do pass it on to to people that you feel would benefit from it. And I'll pop the pop the link back in the chat once more. Um, but yeah, that's that's all from me really. Um, other than just thanks, Casper. Thank you again. Well done, Casper. Thanks yeah. everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thanks, Casper. So I'm here with uh, Director of Breaking Through, Dan Lawton. Thanks for joining me, Dan. Hello. <laughs> um, so first of all, can you just tell us a bit about your, your professional background, uh, how you got into this field and the sort of summary of your work so far? Yeah, so uh, I always wanted to sort of work in film. Um, I didn't really know what sort of thing I wanted to go into. So obviously went to uni and found my feet in documentary was the kind of thing for me all those years ago. Um, I've been working at sort of large platforms um, for the last five-ish years, making documentaries, branded pieces, things like that. Um, that's my professional background. I've been making lots of short docs in the background um, pretty much constantly throughout, um, trying to get into festivals, things like that. Um, I've also, I started a magazine about two years ago, just about people doing what they love to do. Um, it's photo and written, and now it's sort of launching online as a bit of a video series, um, which I'm kind of working on in the background as well, which is great. So yeah, it's all, all kind of documentary and people, I think, are my, my main things. Nice, that sounds really good. What's the name of that magazine? Uh, Zeal. Zeal. Yes, yeah, Zeal magazine. A-L? Z-E-A-L, yeah. Nice, I'll look at that. Um, and so in terms of this film, how did you come to, to meet Guy and how did this, this project come about? So I was working on a, a branded thing um, and we were casting a army specialist. Um, so we were talking to some army specialists, casting people, um, and they actually brought up Guy's name and he sent in a little video with a brief, really brief overview now looking back of what he does and, and how his story sort of goes. Um, it didn't work for the, the branded thing that actually got pulled in the end. The branded thing didn't go ahead, but um, I wanted to carry on sort of talking with Guy and, and see if he'd be up for something. I knew there was something in what he did and his story. Um, so it drew me in. I asked Guy if he wanted to have a phone call um, and Guy was really keen um, and up for it. Just he was really open and up for telling his his story and sort of it was the tip of the iceberg when we started chatting and there's all these other layers. Um, so yeah, big respect to Guy for actually opening up like that, especially um, after everything he's been through and things. Yeah, he's, he's a great storyteller. That's always impressive yeah. to see how sort of open and uh, forthcoming he is. Yeah, I think it just is the, the personal story showing the, the sort of bigger picture. It's like a, a sort of representation of what things could be like, you know. Mm, yeah, for sure. So going into the project, what were your hopes and expectations? What did you envisage the film to be and did it live up to that or was it different? Um, I think going into the project initially very similar, like, like I just said, it's sort of a bigger picture through Guy's personal story, um, where his story can kind of open people's minds to a, a grand sort of overall perspective, I guess. Um, so I never envisioned it would get as sort of deep into Guy's story as it did. And I'm so happy it did because it kind of, it just kept developing as we were going. And obviously we built up a bit of a rapport and things like that for Guy to open up and, um, yeah, I think it, it, it went further than I thought it would, which is a really, really good thing for the film. Did you have any prior knowledge of, um, of psychedelics and psychedelic therapy before, before you started filming? Very little. Um, in terms of psychedelic therapy, I knew there was sort of, you know, ayahuasca and things like that, um, but never in, in sort of where it's actually at now and how, how big the UK are as a part of sort of testing and, and uh, research and things like that. Um, so yeah, in that sense, it was little, but I was very interested. It's an interesting topic. And then when Guy and I were in conversation and it was like PTSD meets uh, psychedelics, I think those two worlds colliding was something I was really interested in. And obviously you spoke to Dr. Ben Sessa as well in the film, as well as um, an underground therapist. Mm. How did that, how did you get in touch with them? And what was it like talking to them? 
Uh, I mean, talking to the both of them was really interesting hearing one person who sort of does it underground um, and someone who's very much at, at like their faces at the front of it kind of thing. Um, so I think that was really interesting hearing two different views that all have the same point. It's just a matter of sort of legal situations. Um, and I guess training as well. Um, but yeah, they were both really, really great, actually. I really, really enjoyed spending time with both of them. Mm. Yeah, all three of the people um, who feature in the film have a very um, special way of, of, of speaking and delivering, which is the whole oh. film came across really understated. And there's a kind of tendency within, within psychedelics to kind of sensationalize and uh, have these like grand narratives, but it was, I really enjoyed how sort of down to earth and understated it was. I think you did that really well. Yeah, I think I kind of went into the film wanting it to be shown to the people who, like that, that group of people or that, that type of person who doesn't believe it's a positive thing or even open to the fact that, that psychedelics can help people. Mm. Um, so I think I always had that in the back of my mind. I wanted it made for those people to show the other side. Um, and sort of there's a lot of things along the way where you like you say you could sort of sensationalize some bits and things like that which would elevate maybe a, a certain point of view from these viewers um and sort of switch them off as opposed to making them understand draw them in yeah i mean guy talks about his his parents reaction at one point which mm. was very uh striking in that he, he he'd had this transformational really positive experience and didn't feel able to properly talk about it and to share it with other people because they thought that it was just just a drug experience yeah that's that's like the way that people have been drilled in and it's a big thing in terms of perspective and generational you know it's sort of going with that generation and there's all that sort of thing um yeah uh so coming up coming up in the future what's what's on your radar now what projects are you uh, have you got lined up um, I'm working on a few short docs, um, maybe about like 10 minutes long, a couple for, for Zeal actually to sort of launch the online -y, um, side of it, um, mainly on people who have sort of followed their passions or um, like a sports person or there's some sort of um, drag racing sort of thing going on in the east of England. Um, I'm also looking at a short doc when I'm able to actually film with them on a para ice hockey team. Um, Oh, wow. As, uh, in Sheffield, they've got sort of one of the UK's top teams. They're not quite at international standards yet, but all of them have sort of been through different traumas. And um, yeah, I think it's going to be a really, really good, interesting film that. So lots of little shorts. Um, also got some long form pitches I'm trying to get out there off the back of this film, you know, um, as sort of, as you say, marketing, things like that go. You want to have those long form pitches ready. Um, I think the long form stuff is the next next sort of break for me. So that all sounds good. That um, ice hockey team story sounds like a really yeah. I think that'd be a really strong one. Um, like everyone's got their own individual stories, and they all sort of come together in this team, and um, it's almost like a family for them. Especially after everything, they've obviously not been able to be on the ice with their friends and stuff. So mm -hmm. with that support system for them returning, it'll be great. You certainly covered this one really well. Um, it's, a, it's a brilliant documentary. Thank uh, you. I, I said really when I saw it, it's probably, probably the best I've seen about psychedelics. Um, and it's awesome that you're, you're sharing it for free as well. Uh, Thank it's, you. It's, yeah. The more eyes on it, the better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I hope everyone enjoys it and gets something from it as well. Thanks. <laughs>